Uh, my name is Luke Vestal. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Bellwoods Brewery. Uh, we opened our brew pub, uh, brewery brew pub in Toronto, downtown Toronto on Ossington Avenue um, back in 2012. Um, and we began just as a brew pub and as we began producing a little bit more beer, we started a bottle shop and started doing pop-up bottle shops and sold beer to the public. And um, with time, we were able to acquire a little bit more space on Ossington started brewing a little bit more volume and, and opened a full-time retail store um, and then eventually expanded into a production brewery at a separate facility in the north end of Toronto um, where we produce, we focus mostly on our, our, what are now maybe you could call core brands. We don't have a typical core brand structure but our, our larger volume beers that we wholesale um, are produced there and as well as our barrel program. We do, since we've opened, we've, uh, do a, we've been producing a lot of barrel aged beer um, both mixed ferment and um, imperial stouts primarily. Um, imperial stouts going into clean spirit barrels and we use um, X wine barrels predominantly from Ontario but as well as from California and we have some fooders that we purchased from Italy um, and we age our mixed ferment beers in those as well. Um, we've been producing a wide range of beers ever since day one. I mean, as a snapshot of our, fir like our, our first four tanks when we opened originally in 2012, we're filled with a Saison, a Pale Ale, a Double IPA, and a Double. And then we followed that by a, a Triple that we barrel aged, which became a beer that we still do, um, Grandma's Boy. Um, and we put that was a mixed ferment barrel aged beer that put on fruit. So one of our first brute beers did go in for barrel aging in a mixed ferment fashion. And we've sort of um, you know expanded and grown from that sort of um, lineup, if you will. We're, we've been inspired heavily by American craft beer. Um, when we opened, there was a bit of a hole in the market in terms of what was being offered. There were craft beers, craft breweries in Ontario. But no one was really pushing the envelope on the, what was happening in the American craft beer scene, the new, new wave IPAs and, and Imperial Stouts and so on. So we, we drew a lot of inspiration from that, as well as from Belgian breweries like Cantillon, uh, traditional Belgian breweries like Cantillon. We, uh, uh, that's always been a big inspiration for me since before we opened. Alambic breweries in general, Dre Fontaine and, and, and Tilken. And, um, and then as we started to travel here, De La Seine um, and breweries like that as well. So we do draw heavily from the, um, Belgian breweries for inspiration as well. Today we, uh, we produce almost 15,000 hectoliters a year and uh, about four-fifths of that is out of our production brewery. But that includes our barrel aged program, so I wouldn't say it's just core brands. We do small batch for um, local market as well as uh, imperial, imperial stouts for barrel aging, and which go to the local market and some export because they export very well. And uh, we have a cool ship there now as well. So for the last five years, we've been using a cool ship and doing spontaneous, full spontaneous uh, fermentation, inoculated in the cool ship. And um, at, at our, we have a, our, uh, this year's anniversary beer, which is Motley Crue. We do a, a, a barrel blend called Motley Crue every year. And this year is a, it's a three-year blend, sort of um, modeled after a, a traditional Lambic, using aged hops and um, turbid match and uh, the, whole, the whole deal. Um, so this yeah. is your 10 years? 10 years this year. And we celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Exactly, you survived. Yeah. Gosh, you know? yeah. Uh, what, uh, what have you seen the evolution in consumer tastes in Ontario, perhaps in Canada? Well, when we, craft beer, uh, yeah. well when we first opened, I think our big, our, we spent a lot of energy and focused a lot on updating the, the palate to modern hop usage and it, it, at the time IPAs in, in Ontario were a bitter mess of like amber, I, amber ales hopped too bitterly without that much aroma and we you know we up quickly probably quadrupled we were even to now we've probably over quadrupled how much dry hop we use for example in, in our beers and the, the amounts that we were using was, were just not feasible to breweries at that time they couldn't you know they just it just seemed wasteful and you know at a point dry, dry hopping excessively can be wasteful but to a point you're never going to brew a great hazy IPA unless you're dry hopping appropriately and so we uh, you know we were um, 
definitely influenced by breweries that were you know pushing the envelope on that and we were right right in, in that and sort of in we were one of the first that were doing hazy ipas and stuff like that in canada um and so i think you know a lot of efforts gone into updating the, the ipa palette and you know we've, we've been a part of that scene as well as sour beer there were there weren't as far as I know, any sour beers available outside of Lambics and imported Belgian beers being produced in Ontario when we first opened. So we started playing around with Berliner Weisses. And um, in terms of sour beer, we were, it was more, our, our barrel program at that point was mostly Brett focused. It wasn't actually heavily sour. Most of the acidity was coming from quick ferments. And so our, our beer, one of our biggest selling beers now is Jelly King. It's actually our biggest selling beer by volume when you, you include all the fruit variants. It's a uh, general listing in the LCBO in Ontario. We export quite a bit of it. And that's a quick sour, uh, dry hop, uh, a dry hop sour, quick sour uh, in, in tanks and then fruited in various ways and dry hop. And um, that, that sort of evolved out of very early brews. And um, I think a lot of energy was spent in educating the consumer about sour beer and how that's a, you know, we're, we're... Must have been a shock to Canadians' palates. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. I mean, some people right out of the gate love it, yeah. right? But then some people, you know, it was at a time where, like, that was unusual. So you, you'd get people turning their beer away because it's sour and it's gone off. And, you know, so it's about, it, there was a lot of education in the early days. Quite the opposite now. I think, you know, that's like, sour. Nobody's really, nobody in the beer community is uninitiated in the sour beer, obviously. Um, <laughs> super hoppy hazy IPAs and all of that so we've um, although we've we haven't abandoned our experimental side and our playful side of the brewery um, so we do some smoothie beers for example now which you know are they're beer cocktails they're not traditional beers in any means and um, so we we've been doing playing around with, uh, smoothie beers which ex excite people we've also been playing um, increasing our lager production and doing traditional um, Czech German inspired lagers um, and they've been doing quite well as well. Um, we didn't have the tank space to devote to lagering in our original space, so we didn't start doing lagers until 2016 when we op opened our production facility. So it's been great um, going into there. As far as the consumer's palate, I think you know the lager is again, once again, accepted as a as a good craft beer option exactly. in, in, in the North America. Years. Yeah, the last amazing. couple of years, yeah. exactly. So it's been great being involved in that. Um, you know, so it's it's on both extremes, like. The pastry stout is generally more accepted as a, as a, you know, not a goofy, but like a solid craft beer option, as well as, you know, a delicate 4% lager is also, you know, accepted. So I think the consumers become more open-minded, generally become more open-minded to, to what beer is and more open-minded to, you know, things like beer cocktails and stuff like that, which is great. Like we, you know, we are in it, we're, you know, part of our love for craft beer is the experimentation and the playfulness of it. So. Um, to have access and, and the ability to, and our staff level has gone up. We have a, a big brewing team that has that draws talent from a wide variety of backgrounds, um, bringing uh, experience in lager production as well as um, non-alc beer production. We're working on developing non-alcoholic beer right now. Um, and what's yeah. your background? My background. Uh, so how did you get into this? Well, my background personally is in biochemical engineering. I went through school. Um, I did an undergrad in biochemical engineering. I decided at graduation that I wanted to open a brewery and then quickly realized I didn't know the first thing about a fucking brewery. I didn't know what a mash ton was or anything. Um, so I decided it would be good to get a job at a brewery, but it was not easy to get a job at a brewery. I also didn't home brew at the time. I started as a home brewer as a brewer later on before Bellwoods, but um, we... Um, I started grad. I went into grad school, and as I dropped out of grad school to take on a job at Amsterdam Brewing Company, which is actually a brewery in Toronto, a, a brewery that opened in the. It started as a brew pub in the 90s in Toronto, and, and it has grown into a, a large production brewery. They, they do have a brew pub again. They didn't for a while. They do have a brew pub again, um, doing predominantly blonde ales and and pale ales and more traditional Ontario. They get into some experimental stuff now. But they've been there. Most of their markets, um, I guess, uh, when I was there, was dominated by a, a, a decent blonde ale, um, and they weren't doing a ton of experimentation. And I, so I, I brewed there for four years. Met my business partner Mike, who was also a brewer at Amsterdam, and we decided to open our own brewery in the, like a neighborhood brewery. Uh, we're on we're in the Ossington Strip of Toronto, which is 
just ranked as number 14 coolest neighborhood and yeah. coolest street by uh, Time Out Magazine just recently, actually. And the picture in that Time Out Magazine is uh, next door to our brew pub, and the f they mentioned us right on that on, in their first mention. Um, it's a very cool, trendy strip in Toronto, a, a lot of energy, a lot of interesting, you know, uh, restaurants and the art scene is really thriving in that area. So it's great to be on that strip and we've been there for 10 years. Where do you go from here? Uh, you from here? Expand or well, we just expanded. We did just expand our brew pub. So we acquired the space to the south of our original brew pub. So we, we actually have three storefronts right now. The first being where we've, uh, the middle one where we've moved into 2012, 2013. We acquired the one to the north where we added tanks and expanded and ex opened our, our retail store. And then now, we, just weeks ago, we opened the um, doors to our expanded brew pub which added about 80 seats and we pulled the kitchen out of our brewing area which was shared space so we couldn't operate a weekday lunch out of our kitchen until recently um, and now we have a devoted kitchen our chef's very happy we have a, a good good footprint for the kitchen with you know a well-designed layout and appropriate amount of equipment um, compared to a you know a pokey kitchen in the corner of the brewery so our, our menu has just expanded so it's where we're going. We want to get this place on its feet, smooth operation. You know, we, we're just, staff is challenging right now with um, dealing with, you know, fallout of COVID. And so staffing the kitchen and front of house has been challenging, but it, but it looks good. We're just um, trying to find our feet and get that place into smooth operation. And then we we have a few projects on the back burner like we wanted to add we're going to we're going to be adding some smaller single batch tanks at our production brewery so that we can focus on single batch um, uh, more one-off production and, and exciting variants of various things like jelly king we could do small experimental variants of it or smoothie beers or imperial stouts and do you know different spicing and stuff like that so we're, we're actually focusing more on building out our small tanks than our large tanks we do have some large 200, um, I guess what is our, our largest tank would be uh, 140 barrel tanks um, that we use. We're, we're focusing more on bringing in more 30 barrel tanks. We can do more, more experimentation actually. Um, we were trying to simplify our life pre-COVID and decided to try to streamline our brand and go more to a core brand structure. And that lasted about three months until COVID hit and we realized we needed to adapt our model anyway because online sales were now, all, all of a sudden, online sales were our, our primary um, retail outlet, um, direct to consumer uh, by far. And, and they're okay and, to drink at home. And they're okay to drink at home. And the reach is much further than feeding predominantly locals around our retail store. People would come into our retail store. But what happened was the, the demand for our one-offs um, completely shifted. It was pre-COVID, we were pushing more and more, not we weren't pushing, the consumer was, was buying more and more of our core lager, our Jutsu, our Pale Ale, Bellweiser, our lager. Roman Candle, the, the IPA that they all recognized, and it was, and then COVID hit, and online sales started, and then there was, it was all of a sudden, whatever was new and exciting. So, it's um, allowed us to get back to more what our roots are, which is experimentation and and, and playing like a around. Great learning experience. The Great learning experience. You can three, three, yeah, that whole model. We have had a whole <laughs> business model set up, and it lasted three months. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for talking to the Beer Radiance. Uh, it's been oh. wonderful to meet you as a fellow Canadian. Likewise. Thank uh, you. Great beer in Canada.